Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Jessick. I'm the Sexual Assault Hit Initiative and Sexual Assault Response Team Manager with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, so I'll be kicking off the presentation this morning, but I'm going to allow uh, my colleague Leah Forney to introduce herself briefly um, before we get started. Good morning, everybody. I am Leah Forney. I am the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Victim Advocate, as well as the Underserved Populations Policy Advocate here at Encasa. Over to you, Laura. All right. So um, this morning we'll be talking about the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative um, in, the, in Maryland. Uh, this is a bit of a national effort. Um, so today we're specifically speaking to Maryland's project and it doesn't necessarily apply to um, other sexual assault kit initiative projects across the country. The project is funded um, through the sexual assault kit initiative grant, but anything during this presentation um, may not represent the opinions of the Bureau of Justice Assistance who funds this work. So I'm gonna get started by just talking about the Saki Overview, which as I just noted, is um, funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance through the Department of Justice. So there's a number of goals um, that the Saki project has. And I think largely the easiest way I explain it is, um, it relates to the end the backlog initiative that Mariska Hargitay kind of highlighted several years ago through the documentary um, I Am Evidence. And it really kind of launched national efforts to address the growing number of unsubmitted and untested kits in, this, in the country um, and prevent a future backlog from occurring. So not only getting kits tested, but also making sure that we test kits appropriately moving forward. And that's exactly what Maryland is doing through the funding. Um, the state has developed or um, completed an inventory of all untested kits in the state of Maryland. Um, there's goals to address tracking of these kits through uh, the implementation of a sexual assault evidence kit tracking system and getting those kits tested um, appropriately. Also funding for investigations and prosecution, and then victim services and engagement, which is MCASA's role in Maryland's project in conducting victim notification. Funding through um, Saki can also fund um, the VICAP program. Um, VICAP is the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. So it allows law enforcement agencies from across the country to compare crimes that they're seeing, based on like an MO um, um, or something uh, distinctive about an offender that they're seeing crimes occur in their community. So maybe a certain type of tattoo that an offender has um, that can go into VICAP and it can help connect crimes throughout the country. Um, you can also use money for lawfully owed DNA and for helping with storage of sexual assault evidence kits. So Maryland Sexual Assault Kit Initiative um, was really led by a committee that is a state level committee known as the Sexual Assault Evidence Kit Policy and Funding Committee. From here on out, I'm just gonna call it the state committee. Um, but this committee led the statewide efforts to first and probably possibly, I don't wanna say most importantly, but first we had to get an understanding of how many untested kids we have in the state. That was our first task under the Saki grant. Um, and I'm gonna throw up if I can a poll for you all to see um, your thoughts on um, looks like this might be the incorrect poll, but I'm gonna try it. Um, on how large of a backlog you think Maryland has. Let me see. Yeah, this is the wrong um, poll, so I apologize. Um, I'm gonna end that, um, but so sorry about that, but I was hoping to get your feel for what numbers you think Maryland has in terms of how many untested kids. 
So if you'd like to throw that in the chat, just to kind of see what you guys think we're dealing with, um, I'll keep an eye on that. But basically, as we conducted an inventory across the state, um, we were looking at kits that were not ever tested for foreign DNA older than May 1st, 2018. So um, we were we quickly discovered as a state that in Maryland, we have what is kind of uncommon. It is called an unsubmitted um, backlog. So there are two types of backlog across the country. There's an untested backlog, and that means that a law enforcement agency submitted a kit to a crime lab to have it tested for foreign DNA, and the crime lab has just never gotten to it. So they are so inundated with other crimes, other DNA testing, so understaffed that they've not been able to get to testing those kits. Again, that's an untested backlog. Maryland, our lab is all caught up. What we are dealing with in Maryland is an unsubmitted backlog. So this means that for whatever reason, when law enforcement was looking at a case, they decided not to submit the rape kit to the crime lab for DNA testing. So we were looking at how many of those do we have in the state? And we've ended up with an inventory of about 7,500 kits that were never submitted to the crime lab for testing. So again, those are just kits older than May 1st, 2018. So from May 1st onward to today, that number, those kits are not included in that number. So once we did an inventory of our um, unsubmitted backlog, and we know we're dealing with over 7,000 untested kits, we started the testing and tracking process. Um, so that means submitting these kits to the crime lab for testing to get them tested, and then tracking, um, looking into purchasing a tracking system. So the state is um, looking to implement a kit tracking system, I think, I'm hoping, don't hold me to it, in March of this year, which means that every survivor who receives an exam and has a kit collected will be able to track their kit through the testing process um, like they would, I, I hate to make the comparison, but like they would a package they're waiting for delivery on. Um, so it really helps to keep survivors informed and it'll also help the state understand our testing progress. That uh, is law enforcement submitting more of these kits te for testing than they have historically, and how is the lab doing with testing them? Funding, of course, is also being used for investigations and prosecutions. Ideally, we're holding more offenders accountable for um, crimes that may have happened years ago, um, but then also um, holding offenders accountable by changing our testing policies moving forward. Providing training like these, also training to law enforcement um, on getting kits submitted. Um, for example, the state legislature implemented a statutory requirements on testing kits. So law enforcement is obligated to test all sexual assault evidence kits unless one of four exemptions is met. Um, and those exemptions can be pretty narrow. So the idea is providing that training so that our law enforcement agencies are complying with that testing criteria. And then as I said, MCASA's role, victim services or notification. So we're gonna dive into that today. Um, the victim notification protocol, which is our state protocol. It's a lovely short document of about like 56 pages. Um, I can put a link for that in the chat or send it out to the group if anyone's particularly interested in seeing the breakdown of how we want to conduct notifications in Maryland. So the protocol was developed in collaboration with the Sexual Assault Evidence Kit Policy and Funding Committee. That's the state, state committee that oversees kind of this work. And it includes advocates, forensic nurses, state's attorneys, crime lab personnel, law enforcement, state legislatures, We've brought in some survivors um, to speak on their experiences. So it's a real multidisciplinary team. When developing the protocol, we looked at current practices used by other Saki sites that they sound, found successful. We didn't want to start from square one. Um, and Saki has existed for several years. So there are other states and jurisdictions throughout the country that have been doing this longer than we have. So we really dove into what works. 
And then all sexual assault response teams in Maryland were visited um, by MCASA, members of the committee, to go over this protocol we developed and get their input on how should we be conducting these notifications. For reference, um, this means we're co contacting survivors that reported a rape or sexual assault prior to May 1st, 2018. And these kits date back to the 80s. The oldest kit that I have worked with a survivor on was from 1979. So these kits mean, these untested kits mean the individual connected to the kit was left with unanswered questions for could be since 2018, or it could be 30, 40, even more years ago. And we're kind of reminding them of what, of what happened to them and letting them know that their kit was identified as being untested. Maryland took a slightly unique approach and we have a notify all approach. Um, so this means that regardless of why we are notifying that individual, whether DNA was found in their kit or not, whether there was a hit to a known offender or there's prosecution, we are notifying the individual that their kit was identified by this project. Um, there was some pushback on that. A lot of feelings that that could be re-traumatizing to survivors, that if nothing's gonna happen with their case, we shouldn't remind them of this trauma. But when doing research on developing a protocol, focus groups were conducted by the Joyful Heart Foundation where the majority of survivors indicated that they felt that that kit belonged to them and they deserved to know what happened to it and that it sat there for so long. Um, and so we really took that to heart and we decided that we wanna notify everyone and let each survivor decide, decide what information they would like to receive from us. They can decide what's best for them. We don't wanna sit around a table as a group of professionals and say, oh, well, in this case, we think these survivors are too fragile to hear this information. That's not fair and that's not for us to determine. So we wanna give each survivor that we can opportunity to receive this information if they would like it. And if they don't want it, then we would, um, let go of that and, you know, not contact them again moving forward. So um, throughout this presentation, and if you look at our protocol, we do use the word victim or survivor. Um, I try to use survivor um, more than I use victim, but um, victim is the term that is often used by the Bureau of Justice Assistance in the Saki Project. So you'll hear kind of both interchangeably. We do recommend that when working with a survivor or a victim, you use the terminology that they identify with. So what does our notification protocol look like? There's a couple guiding principles, which I hope are just things that you guys are already, would make sense to include in such a protocol. But the first thing we wanna cover is that, what do we mean by notification? Um, notification for us is that phone call, that contact with the survivor, explaining the project, explaining that their kit was identified and it was tested now. Um, but it's important that we note that notification isn't a one-time event. It's ongoing communication, check-in phone calls, providing support and advocacy to each individual. Some individuals indicate they never want to hear from us again, and that's okay. Some individuals ask us to do regular follow-up phone calls while they decide how they wanna move forward with this information and if they would like to see it. The important piece is, is that we're meeting them where they're at and we let them know that we're available to them should anything change or they have any questions. So even if somebody says, thank you for the information, but I don't wanna hear from you again, that is okay, but we will let them know you're welcome to reach out to us if you feel you need anything or you have any questions. And those questions can be both legal and related to advocacy and support services, because this can bring up psychological issues as well. Those traumatic memories, that tra trauma response that people may experience when they're getting this information and this reminder of what they experience. So it's important to be aware of those things. Our guiding principles are, um, Pretty straightforward, I think, to advocates. We want to be victim-centered. We want to keep the victim at the center of all decisions. Um, 
we should not be making decisions on their behalf. We should be taking into consideration their needs and where they're at. Um, and that includes, do they want to be involved in this process moving forward? Um, I think, you know, the important thing to consider is we often look about, think about, do survivors want to re-engage? Do they want this information? And I don't know how often we think about will survivors be forced to re-engage? If we identify a repeat offender or a known offender that people would like to prosecute, we do not wanna force that survivor to endure and go through the prosecution process if they don't want to. So again, it's all about honoring the victim's choice, respecting their safety, and really focusing on their well-being and their needs over everything else. And this goes for not just notification, but this goes for everything and engaging with survivors of sexual assault is that the needs of the victim should be everyone's concern. Just because we're an advocate doesn't mean we're the only person who should be putting priority on those survivors' needs. It should be everyone involved. And then the second guiding principle, of course, is being trauma-informed. So I, I really view, and I think it makes sense to view trauma-informed and victim-centered together um, in that you really should, shouldn't be one without the other. You should be trauma-informed and prioritizing the victim's safety, whether that's physical and emotional. And I really wanna highlight the second, or yeah, the second bullet, bullet point, strengthening a victim's capacity to recover with information, resources, services, and support. We don't just want to make this phone call or talk to a survivor and say, hey, your kit was never tested. Do you want that information now? Would you like your kit tested now? Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. We want to make sure we're talking about their support system. Do they want more information about the project? Do they need any services and support? And that might be services like advocacy or counseling, but it also might be, hey, I can't process this right now because my family's struggling to get food. So it might be identifying and working with them on other resources for their family, just to get to the point where maybe they feel a little bit more secure where they can deal with um, this actual notification. So when we're conducting notifications, we really wanted to put into perspective what does this look like when we're calling somebody up after several years, whether that's six years or 30 years, what does that look like? And how can we empower each survivor? So we came up with two notification processes. The first would be active notification and the second is opt-in notification. So I'm actually gonna start with the right-hand side of the screen on opt-in notifications. Opt-in notifications just mean as, I think it's pretty straightforward. Somebody can call us and opt in to receive information about their kit. So we have a hotline and we have a email service where somebody can contact us and say, I was assaulted in 2015 in Baltimore County. No one ever told me what happened to my kit. I don't know anything about it. Please contact me with that information they can outline how they wanna be contacted, when they wanna be contacted, you know, is it safe um, to leave a voicemail message? They really can outline exactly how they would like to hear from somebody. They can also say, I heard about this project. My kit wasn't, I don't know what happened to my kit. Please don't ever contact me. I've moved on from my life and I don't wanna revisit this part. And we will honor that request and enter it into our, um, notification preferences database so that we're not um, contacting somebody who doesn't want to be contacted. I will say that not many people use the opt-in notification. We have had billboards, we have uh, social media posts, we try and do regular trainings and lunch and learns. We're not seeing that many opt-in notifications. So what do we do when 
we don't have somebody that opted in and we have their kit testing results. That's when we go to active notification. So when one of us, it's Leah, myself, we have another advocate, Carrie, who will be calling that person and saying and letting them know that their kit was identified through this through the project. This means that it's a cold call. They're not necessarily expecting the call. We don't know what circumstances they're answering the call in. I know I heard a story when we were starting to develop our protocol that an agency in Ohio um, contacted a survivor. She answered the phone and she, the advocate started speaking about the project and the call was cut off. It ended. And she found out that um, the reason it was cut off was because the survivor ended the call because she was in the car with her family and she had answered the phone on Bluetooth but her family was not aware of what had happened to her. So thankfully the survivor did call the advocate back and they were able to talk and work through that. But that's just to say that we really don't know how somebody in the environment somebody's in when they're answering that call. So our protocol breaks down more specifics on how to be sensitive to that and understanding that it may not be safe or private. So we really have to ease into these conversations which can be incredibly difficult because a lot of people get defensive, um, want to know why we're asking if they're in a safe or private place, really can amp up anxiety. Um, but we we try to work with them through that once we get to convey the information and reason for our call. But safety is our priority. So when will notifications be conducted? Um, so there's a couple... I'm going to put up a poll. I think this is, I'm not gonna put up a poll because there it is. Um, this is probably the poll that you accidentally launched earlier, but when do you think a survivor should be contacted about their untested kit? Should it be um, before we even test that untested kit? Um, once testing is completed, once and only if an offender is identified or only if prosecution is being considered and case by case. And I guess I already gave away what our approach is in Maryland, but I still like your opinions. I'm gonna give it a couple seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Um, so it looks like pretty even in terms of case by case considerations or once testing is complete. Mm. And then that's followed by most answered with before even testing the kits. And it looks like we have a response for only if prosecution is being considered. Um, so I'd really like your thoughts on why um, you may have answered the way you did. I have the chat up and I do see Emery's question, so I will get to that, I promise. Um, but any thoughts that you have, please feel free to share in the chat. Um, we, as I said, took a notify all approach. <clears throat> we decided that we want to notify each individual that we possibly can about this project and their untested kit. When that happens in the process can vary a little bit. So in most cases, and I actually, we might need to change this slide because I don't know if it falls under most, um, but the approach we came up with when developing the protocol was that most cases, we would be notifying somebody once we have results. So not just calling them and opening the door to this traumatic information and then leaving that door open, but being able to provide an answer. So your kit was identified as untested. We have tested your kit now. Would you like that information? Um, and I think I see in the chat, Amanda said, we need to acknowledge the needs of the victim. We should ask them what they want. Um, and I completely agree. So that kind of conversation, I just gave an example of, of your kit was identified. We've tested it. Would you like that information? 
case by case in the sense that we're allowing the victim to decide what information they receive. But we want to give each victim the opportunity to make the choice that's best for them. So that's why we say notify all. I see some agreement in the chat and I really appreciate that. Veronica, I think people said, I think people deserve to know what happens when they have a kit done, regardless of where the kit is in the process. Exactly. Um, and if you look at the Joyful Heart Foundation study, which I can provide a link to, a lot of them even said like, it's part of them. It Part of their body was taken to be part of that kit and they deserve to know if they would like to know it. And then Amber noted about reactivating autonomy after an event where their autonomy was taken. And that's exactly right. We don't want to put ourselves, whether we think as providers that we are doing what's best for the victim, we don't wanna put ourselves in a power position that takes choice away from the survivor because that's exactly what happened to them when they were assaulted. Um, <clears throat> so, Amanda, I see your question on, should notify all be something that is done during the intake or after? I feel like they should be notified if they ask to be during the initial intake. So I think, I think I follow that. And I'm, I'm gonna answer, I hope this answers your question. So when we make contact with each survivor, we ask when, if they want the information. So each survivor we talk to is informed that their kit was identified as part of this project. And then from there, they get to decide, do I want that information or not? Do I want to talk to law enforcement or not? So they really have that power to decide if they want the information. We've had survivors that said, I don't wanna know. Um, thank you for calling me, but I don't wanna know. And then we've had survivors that are very eager for that information. So our goal is to notify each person and provide them with an understanding of the project and how they are involved and then let them choose from there. I hope that makes sense and hope that answers your question. Um, we don't force information on each survivor we contact. So if we're not gonna start the phone call with, your case was never tested, your kit was never tested, it has been now, and we have identified an offender. It's a slow process of letting them know that there's new information. And I'm sorry, I'm reading through the chat, but I'm gonna continue on with this slide and I promise I'll get back to the chat. Um, so our goal is that the majority are notified once testing is complete. That means we're not just throwing information to them that their kit was untested, but we're also able to provide, I don't wanna say a solution, but the end result. Um, so not only was their kit not tested, but we did something about it. And here's what that information or the testing yielded. That's the goal. However, in some cases, and I'm actually, Leah, I don't know if you would agree, but I actually feel like this is the majority of the cases we see. Um, some cases, notification happens before testing. So For every kit that is collected, somebody is supposed to ask the survivor if they had consensual sex within about a two week period of the assault. This is to make sure that a survivor, a survivor's consensual partner isn't accidentally identified as an offender. So we really wanna protect that consensual partner as much as possible. So somebody should be asking that on the front end. Somebody should also be asking for a survivor's DNA sample. You would think like, oh, it would just happen naturally as part of the kit, but they need, I don't like this language, but they need like a pure sample. If you're taking swabs that may be contaminated with an offender or consensual partner's DNA, they need something that is just guaranteed to be the victim's profile. This, this way they can easily sort out whose DNA belongs to who. Unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, no one asked about consensual partners, and in some cases, no one obtained a survivor DNA sample. So in those scenarios, 
we are contacting survivors before their kit can be tested because we need that information. The other scenario is that until 2020, uh, law enforcement agencies in Maryland could use waivers of investigation. That meant that they could present a survivor reporting a rape or sexual assault with a form that said essentially, I waive my right to have this case investigated. I will not hold law enforcement accountable. I will not sue law enforcement for not investigating this crime I reported, and I won't bring this up ever again. And that's just a horrible practice. Um, you look into that, those waivers are considered absolutely awful. They've often been signed in scenarios where victims were drunk, um, signed where um, they were pressured, you know, the kind of language of like, oh, but you and your friends were drinking underage. Are you sure you want us to investigate this? Because you could also get in trouble for this. So kind of like trying to persuade a survivor not to report. So for these cases, each survivor that signed a waiver has the right to revoke that waiver. We will attempt to contact them and ask if they knew what they signed and how they feel about it now. Do If they knew what they signed, do they still agree with that? Um, if they don't understand what they signed, let's talk about what your options are now. So those are the scenarios where we'll contact somebody before testing. And like I said, it's actually proving to be the majority of our cases, in my opinion. And they're not easy conversations. Um, to call somebody up and say, hey, 20 years ago, I know you were assaulted. Do you happen to also remember who you had consensual sex with? Um, it's a very difficult conversation to navigate. Um, and I would say that a lot of people get upset. They feel that no one asked them this in the first place, and they feel that that meant they were not believed in the first place, or their kit, no one ever intended to test their kit because they should have asked that if they did plan to test the kit. Um, okay, so I just accidentally scrolled. Sorry. I see in the chat for the state of Maryland, what options do victim survivors have to consult with a free attorney before making this decision on the waiver? Um, could you clarify, are you asking like before they sign a waiver or before they like decide to revoke the waiver, so to speak? I'll keep an eye on the chat. So, it, <clears throat> so in terms of before they decide to sign, it is now, um, against the law for law enforcement agencies to present anyone with a waiver. So if somebody is presented with a waiver, I would say they should immediately contact the Sexual Assault Legal Institute. I do know of one law enforcement agency that we discovered recently that was still utilizing waivers, but other than that, I haven't heard of any. Um, if a survivor is ever presented with a written form to stop an investigation, they should contact Sally um, because Law enforcement isn't even allowed to do that. Even if a survivor says, you know what, I want to stop this investigation. This is really upsetting for me. Um, if it's the survivor's choice and they're they're making that decision for whatever reason, um, that should never, a waiver should never be presented to them. Um, they should never have to sign anything. So I just put it up on the screen, but I'm gonna put up another poll on who do you think should be conducting these notifications? Um, so you'll see several options. So who should be contacting these survivors? Should it be a victim advocate like MCASA, Rape Crisis Center, law enforcement personnel, attorney, a nurse, or a team? You can also put in other, I guess. going to give that a couple seconds. And um, Alyssa put the link to the Sexual Assault Legal Institute in the chat, should you need that. Okay. So it looks like the majority of you said um, victim advocate. A few 
um, suggested law enforcement, a few said a nurse, um, and some of you said a team. So again, feel free to put more thoughts in the chat on why you selected what you did or, or any additional thoughts. Um, but this was a difficult decision for us when looking at the protocol. Um, so we kind of were looking at the fact that, okay, we're contacting somebody about an untested kit and in some cases results. So should that be law enforcement? Because law enforcement's probably the best entity to explain what the results may mean for their case. Um, but also in our experience, a lot of survivors had really bad experiences with law enforcement during the initial investigation and do not want to speak to law enforcement. Um, so we actually decided kind of a hybrid victim advocate team approach. So when we're looking at making notifications, the first point of contact is through an Amkasa Saki advocate. So again, that's myself, Leah, or Carrie. That's the first point of contact to give them information about the project and let them know that their kit was identified as untested through the project. Then if they want more information, we give them the choice to meet with law enforcement. So somebody doesn't wanna engage, we're not gonna force them to talk to law enforcement. If somebody does, we can offer that option to them. And then they are given the option to include one of us in those meetings. So somebody that wants to speak to law enforcement, they can do so alone or with their own support person, or they can have us present as an additional support option. And that's when it becomes a team approach, it is the advocate and law enforcement working together to answer the survivor's questions about their case, about what the testing results mean. And that's gonna be law enforcement's focus during that meeting. While the advocate's focus is going to be on providing support, um, making referrals, and conducting any crisis in intervention that may be needed. Um, so that's where the team approach comes in. And again, we do like to give the survivors the choice. Do they want an advocate present or not? And I'll say anecdotally, that when a survivor chooses to meet with law enforcement with an advocate, we see better results, better engagement, and overall more positive experience for the survivor compared to when a survivor meets with law enforcement alone. We don't want to take that choice from them, but anecdotally speaking, that is what we see. We always do a check-in call with the survivor. Um, after they meet with law enforcement, whether we're there or not. So we always do a follow-up. So obviously MCASA has a team of people that conduct these notifications, um, but could a rape crisis center or another entity make these notifications as well? The short answer is yes. Um, the reason this kind of lives with MCASA, at least for right now, is... <clears throat> One, we're a state site. So if you look at the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative project across the country, there are very few states that are doing this as a state. So for example, if you look at Pennsylvania, the county of Allegheny, which includes Pittsburgh, has Saki funding. And then the city of Philadelphia does as well. But the entirety of the state is not a Saki site. They're not doing anything. So I shouldn't say not doing anything because I don't know that, but they could be doing it outside of Saki money. But in terms of Saki, they are not a Saki site. So that was one of the challenges we had to overcome is being a statewide site. Um, it's, it's a lot of um, trying to corral and herd cats to try and make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of getting kits tested and things like that. Um, but a rape crisis center is more than welcome to work on the cases directly related to their jurisdiction. So um, we would just want to collaborate with that rape crisis center because we do house the opt-in line. So um, survivors from that jurisdiction may be contacting us to let us know how they want to be contacted or if they want to be contacted in the future. And then also 
we have to report state data on our progress. So for example, every quarter we inform the BJA how many survivors were contacted, how many survivors want to move forward, how many survivors want to meet with law enforcement, how many survivors are now deceased. It's a lot of data. Um, so there would just have to be some collaboration there, but rape crisis centers are, and other advocacy agencies are more than welcome to take this on. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Leah in a second. Let me look at the chat real quick because I saw a couple things come in. Amber noted a team should do the notifications because there can be blind spots, spots in each discipline. I think it is helpful to have many options for sur survivors to choose who they want to help them. I think that's a great point. And I also think it's a great point. I think somebody said this is to like check in with them throughout the process. For example, um, I had one of my first notifications. I had a survivor that wanted everything to go through on CASA. She didn't want to talk to the police at all, but then she had to. Um, she had to talk to them to provide her own DNA sample. And so she chose to have an advocate present during that meeting. And then law enforcement handled that meeting so well that when we closed that meeting and asked how she wanted to be contacted moving forward, did she want everything to go through me? Or was she okay hearing directly from law enforcement? And law enforcement handled that meeting so well that she said, I'll just talk to the detective. I don't need a middleman. And I think that means that, that's great. That means law enforcement is doing what they should be doing in terms of how they're handling these cases and engaging survivors. Um, but then checking in with them along the way and making sure things are still going well. Then Amanda noted a victim advocate should be the first point of contact, but a team of all those folks should be available. Um, completely agree. And I think that's the approach we try to take into consideration. Um, and then Leah, I'm sorry, but before I hand this over to you, I want to go back to that first question. Sorry, I have to find it. So Emery had asked back at the beginning of the presentation, could victims bring a civil suit against the law enforcement agency, the city and the state because their kit was not sent forward to the crime labs? So I'm not an attorney, um, but I will say that in my opinion, that door is open for survivors to explore. We have contacted survivors who then meet with one of our Sally attorneys that leads this project and ask about their options for civil suits. Um, we, our, our legal institute does not handle those lawsuits, but we will make referrals um, to individuals that are interested. And I might chime in a little later about something Leah is going to bring up during her portion of the presentation and how that relates to lawsuits. Um, but for now, I'm gonna hand that over to Leah. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I am uh, getting over a cold. All right. My screen is blank, Laura. So, oh. so we're going to talk a little bit about how do we actually, how do notifications actually take place. So as one of the Saki victim advocates, one of the first things we do is we plan before doing these notifications, right? So Essentially, what it looks like is law enforcement will reach out to us to request the notification. And when they request it, they basically let us know why the notification needs to be conducted. So it could be, as Laura mentioned, they need consensual partner information. It could be because there was a waiver sign. It could be a variety of things. It could be that they had already went ahead and tested the kit, and now we have test results. So we do a lot of planning prior to actually notifying the victim. The other thing that we tend to do once we get the notification request is we want to search to make sure whether or not this victim has opted in, right? And if they have opted in, we want to go according to their opt-in preferences. Now, if there is no opt-in um, available, then what we do as the Saki Advocates is we create a notification plan. 
And in that notification plan, we take the information that law enforcement has sent us. So they'll let us know the type of notification that we're making, as well as any contact information that they have available in the case file. And then we proceed with trying to get in contact with the survivor. Next slide. So the second step in our notification process is the contact. So again, we're looking at those opt-in preferences if they are available, right? So in our opt-in, what we will ask um, a survivor is what phone numbers are good to contact them. We'll find out is there a specific day and time. So I'll give a perfect example. I had an opt-in just last week and the survivor was eager to know what happened to her kid, right? And what was gonna happen with law enforcement. So she provided me with two, two numbers where she said, you can leave a voice message on either one of these because no one has access to it. And so this is the type of information we want to know, right? Because a lot of times what we have found, and Laura can attest to this, is that people in their family don't know what happened to them. You know, these survivors may have moved on and, and have gotten married and their, their spouse doesn't know what happened to them. Their partner doesn't know what happened to them. So we want to make sure that if they are opting in, that we're, we are adhering to what they want, okay? Now, the other side to that is that oftentimes we are cold calling them. So these are survivors that have not opted in. So what happens is MCASA and law enforcement will begin to use whatever available contact information that law enforcement provides us, as well as we do some other additional uh, searches just to see if there's any other new information out there. MCASA makes the first contact, right? And that is us making the attempt to reach out to the survivor. Um, if it is a successful notification, during that time, we'll have conversation about um, what the survivor wants moving forward in terms of their preferences. We'll have conversation around whether or not they want to meet with law enforcement. If it is not a successful notification, um, we will have conversations as a team to determine um, based on what type of testing or what type of uh, notification this was, whether or not we tell law enforcement to proceed with testing or not proceed with testing. And then step three is our follow-up meeting. So this is basically the time where, again, based on survivor preferences, after we've had that initial contact, we try to schedule a meeting with the survivor, a member of MCASA's uh, SACI team, and law enforcement. What I can tell you is that oftentimes they love that we are there. Um, and during that time of the meeting, what we try to do is make sure not only us as the advocate issuing an apology, but law enforcement issues an apology. And we do our best to really get law enforcement to understand how this apology can be such a life-changing experience for the survivor. I can tell you that many survivors, when they hear just those words, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry this happened to you. I'm sorry that the system failed you it really does make a difference for them, right? And so you want to make sure, we want to make sure during our follow-up meetings that not only are we apologizing, but we're also outlining next steps, right? So we're discussing, you know, if it's a test result um, meeting, we're discussing what these, these test results actually mean, what are their next steps? This is a meeting really designed to empower the survivor to determine what they want to do next, right? Some survivors come to this meeting, they get the test results, and that's enough for them. It's closure for them. Some survivors come to these meetings and they want to know, do I have any rights to prosecute? Is, you know, what that would look like? Or do I have the option to sue? What would that look like? So they, this meeting is really designed to empower the survivor however they would like to move forward. My job and also our other advocates job is really to help assist with this meeting as well as make those appropriate referrals, right? So this is looks like a collaborative effort, making sure that they're connected to a rape crisis center, a safe program. If they want information from our Sally Institute, all of those things happen in our follow-up meeting. Next slide. So now let's talk about the apology. 
it is absolutely critical <laughs> that an apology is issued. We have witnessed through other Saki sites as well as Maryland agencies that the power that comes with an apology, again, is life-changing for some of these survivors. A lot of these survivors feel un like they weren't believed. They feel unheard. They feel like, you know, they were just left to their own vices. And so when we can apologize and we can empathize with them and validate their experiences, again, it is life-changing for them. On top of that, research has shown us that many survivors feel better once there's an apology, once there's an acknowledgement of the error. And it also has helped with more likeliness to re-engage. A lot of times survivors that we have contacted through this project, they don't want to re-engage because of their feelings around law enforcement, around the justice system, or just how they were treated in the beginning. And so when we approach this as a, an apology and acknowledging of the errors, acknowledging how the system failed them, they are more likely to say, you know what, let's, I want to re-engage and see what happens. And Leah, I'm just going to chime in here real quick um, before I go to the next slide, that um, this was the piece I said earlier, how I might chime in. Um, was when we proposed our notification protocol, which you'll see, I think this um, language here, and I'm sorry it's blurry, but this is actually pulled directly from our protocol on different types of ways for either an advocate or law enforcement to approach. Sorry, Leah, I'm taking your slide. But um, what I wanted to note was when we published this, the first thing law enforcement's feedback was, was that if they offered an apology, they felt that they were more likely to be sued. Um, and I just found that incredibly interesting because that door is already open for each of these survivors. Um, and offering an apology may actually help repair that relationship and repair any quote unquote damage that was done and may actually feel somebody make somebody feel less inclined to sue. And I'm sorry, I just took your side, Leah. I forgot this one was next. So please continue. <laughs> You're fine. So yeah, so based on what Laura said, and I'll and I will say, what we try to do with the apology is really get law enforcement to understand that it is the system that failed them, right? So what we have encountered is that law enforcement oftentimes feels like that because they did not personally do it, they should not have to apologize. And what we're trying to get them to understand is that it is the systematic failure that we are apologizing for. It is the fact that we left survivors without answer. We left them with no closure. For many of them, they thought even back to what Laura was saying about the waivers, they thought when they signed the waiver that that meant that their kit was still gonna be tested. They just wasn't gonna go through prosecution. So all of those things play a role in the systematic failure. And that is the reason why we are strongly suggesting that there's an apology that comes forth because we want them to understand that we're sorry. We're sorry that we left them with uncertainty. We're sorry for the pain that this caused. We are sorry that they didn't get the questions they needed answered, but now we want to rectify that wrong. Next slide, Laura. Okay, so then in step four of our notifications, this is where we want to empower, right? So after we've done the planning, after we've done the contact, after we've had the follow-up meeting, now we are empowering our survivors, right? We're empowering them with an outline of next steps. So this looks like asking them, how do you want to be contacted moving forward, right? Would you like an advocate to check in with you maybe once a month or once a quarter, right? Um, would you like a detailed interview to take place? What does that look like, right? It, and all of these are based on their choices. So a survivor might say, yes, I want to meet and I want to interview. Um, can we do it virtually? Or can we do it at our home? Or can we do it at an off, you know, off site location? All of that is going to be based on them. Right. We've had in-person notifications. We've had virtual notifications. And so it's really going to be on what they want to do. Um, we also ask them questions like, how involved do you want to be in the investigation? 
would you like victim notification of, uh, advocate as well as law enforcement to give you step-by-step -step of what's happening? And then we also ask them about other resources, like would you like us to connect you with any type of therapy services, the Rape Crisis Center, what other services do you feel like you need? Also, when we empower them, we also give them an opportunity to speak privately to an advocate or law enforcement. Oftentimes what we find is that there are some survivors that would like to speak to law enforcement alone. There are other survivors that are like, I, I want an advocate present, right? But with, regardless of whatever they want, we empower them so that they make the best decisions for themselves and we support their decision and, and, and we continue to be with them along the journey. And so before we get into number 19, I know we have a good poll, our last poll for the this training. So this poll is asking, in your opinion, what's the most important piece of the notification? And I'll give y'all some time. I'll give y'all a few more seconds. Okay. So we had about 30% of you saying allowing survivors to opt in or opt out. We had another 30% say the apology. And then about 24% said getting survivor feedback. 9% said the team approach. Awesome. Okay, Laura, you can continue with the slide. So in step five of our notification process, we do offer a sur survey to our survivors. So after we've had the follow-up meeting, after we have empowered them, um, we do ask survivors if they would be willing to take a survey about their experience at a later, later time. And oftentimes this survey is emailed to them with a link. Um, and so if they say yes, we'll contact the survivor to conduct the survey. And really the survey is really designed for us to obtain information that will best help us to guide any future protocols, highlight, area, highlight any areas that we may be looking over. The truth of the matter is Saki is new territory. And so a lot of the stuff that we are encountering is uh, new to us. And so we want to make sure that, again, we're doing what's best for the survivor. Next slide, Laura. So now I want to talk a little bit about the local SART involvement. So again, as Laura had mentioned, we take a team approach here at MCASA. So our local SART, uh, which is our sexual assault response teams, we are we do this as a collaborative effort, right? So it is not just MCASA, not just law enforcement. It is some of our uh, same, our FNEs, which is our forensic nurses, coming together to discuss what survivors are needing, but also how they're impacted by Saki, right? And so in those meetings, we're determining how can we meet those needs, right? We're also addressing the protocol. We're also talking about how we can work um, not only with MCAS and law enforcement to ensure that we're making those proper referrals. Um, we're encouraging team members to look at the numbers, right? And look at their cases with open eyes. So it's a really great time to come together and collaborate and communicate, but also we conduct outreach for agency participation. Um, and MCASA is always willing to help with um, this. We do know that, and Laura could probably address to this more, but we do know that we would love to see more engagement with our SART teams so that we can really figure out as a whole, as a team, how, how can we best help our survivors that have been impacted by the SACI project. Next slide. So what can you do to help? 
Well, you can do a few things. One, you can definitely share the protocol with your member agencies. We would love it if you post our opt-in line information to the agency website and your social media account. Um, definitely work towards ensuring that your SART meets those Comar regu regulations and then conduct outreach to agencies that are not actively involved. Again, MCASA can help with the outreach. So just definitely reach out to us. Our information will be um, on the slide. All right. Thanks, Leah. Um, so we're going to close today with a um, survivor story um, and don't really need to give her much of an introduction because you've been listening to her for the last little bit of time. But Leah Forney, our MCASA Saki advocate and underserved populations policy advocate, was kind and brave enough to share her story with um, actually a group of law enforcement that received uh, similar training to this. Um, and I think it's incredibly powerful. And so I'm going to play that recording. Um, please bear with me because I think I have to stop sharing my screen. And reshare my screen. So, and of course, um, Leah, I'm speaking on your behalf, but uh, Leah is here, so I'm sure she'd be more than willing to answer any questions you have for her about her experience. Just please be mindful um, of the questions that you ask, and I hope you all can see that. If you can't, please put it in the chat, um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. This should have sound significant strength and courage who has been directly impacted um, by the backlog um, in this country of untested rape kits. And she's here to um, share her story and provide some insight on, um, on her experience and what you as law enforcement can do to help in these circumstances. And I do want to note that um, not only are, is she brave and we, we truly appreciate her for reaching out to us and taking this on and being a true oh, voice for people, um, but I just found it so powerful um, that, you know, Leah identifies not as a victim anymore, not as a survivor anymore. And she did move through those, but she is a survivor or thriver in here. And she's doing that and she's thriving because she's had support and um, she's here to, to tell you about that experience that she's had. So I'm gonna hand it over to Leah. We will be monitoring the chat. So any questions you have for Leah, for her experience or for us um, about the protocol, we will loop back to um, being mindful of time and being mindful of um, you know, what types of questions are, are, are given to Leah. Good morning. So first, let me just say thank you to MCASA and Sally for this opportunity to share with you guys. Um, as Laura mentioned, I am a thriver of sexual assault. I do not see myself as a victim or a survivor of sexual assault, but it was not always like that for me, right? And so for me, um, the day that my life changed drastically or what I like to call a defining moment in my life was January 27th, 2013 in the state of North Carolina. I was raped in my apartment by somebody I knew. And so before I go into the details about that or give a brief synopsis about that, one of the things that I want to do um, is kind of dismantle some myths. Uh, and that is because when I have worked with law enforcement, a lot of the conversation was that I wasn't believed because I knew the person. And so just statistically wise, I want somebody to hear this, that nine out of 10 victims of rape are female. 55% of sexual assault occur at or near the victim's home. Eight out of 10 rapes occur by someone the victim knew. 39% of those rapes are committed by an acquaintance and 33% of those rapes are committed by either current or former spouse, boyfriend, and or girlfriend. Now, you're probably saying, why does that even matter, right? And that is because as a thriver of sexual assault, I fell into those statistics. And because I fell into those statistics, I felt that my case was mishandled because law enforcement did not believe that because I knew the person had a casual uh, 
dating life with that person that they could not have briefly, right? And so just a brief synopsis of my story. I met my perpetrator after living in the state of North Carolina for two years. Um, we met at a car rental place. He was working at the car rental place at the time. I happened to be there because I was looking for to rent a car due to my car breaking down, right? He was very charming. He was very sweet. Um, we engaged in conversation. When I did decided not to get the car rental, he offered to drive me home. Hence, he knew where I lived. He even offered to take me to dinner. Hence, he was charming, right? So after about one or two dates with this individual, I decided not to see him anymore. But he was always around. He was always around and he would always randomly pop up in places where I was. It was almost as if he had a GPS on me, right? So January 27, 2013, he randomly calls me, right? When he randomly calls me on that specific day, I happened to be in a very emotional state because I just got off the phone after receiving a phone call of a loved one passing. So when he calls me that day, I'm already an emotional wreck. He offers to come over and, and console me. And against my better judgment, I allow him to. Little did I know he was already sitting outside my apartment. So he comes to my house again, under the, uh, the guidance of I'm here to, to support, here to comfort you. But the minute he walked in my unit, something just did not feel right. There was this gut-wrenching feeling on the inside of me that said something is not right. He sat on my couch and instead of consoling me, he proceeds to want to argue about why I no longer wanted to deal with him. I asked him to leave. And as he pretended to leave, he immediately grabs me and proceeds to rape me right there in my apartment. Now you can imagine, and that's just a brief synopsis of what happened on that day. You can only imagine the emotional turmoil, the physical turmoil, the upset, the fear that I was in in that moment in time in my life. And because of that, I really wanted to share just that, that synopsis so you can understand how difficult this is when you're encountering a victim or a survivor or a thriver of sexual assault. Not many of them have what I like to call the resiliency factor. For me, I was able to bounce back. I was able to get the support, go to therapy, rely on my family, rely on my friends, rely on my spirituality and God to get me through. So many of them don't have that opportunity. And so I wanted yeah, to leave you guys this presentation. with an understanding of how to look at victims. I think many times when we encounter a victim, whether it's a sexual assault of any crime, we immediately think that this individual is weak. And we're not weak. We may be in a weakened state because emotionally we are trying to process all that we feel and all that is coming to us, but we really want to be empowered. We really want to make the right decision for us in order to get through what it is that we're facing. And so every victim, survivor, or thriver of sexual assault needs the following from law enforcement or anyone that they come in contact with, right? And so the V in victim stands for validation. Put yourself in their shoes. What if that was your daughter? What if that was your mom? What if that was your aunt? What if that was your uncle? Put yourself in their shoes empathize with them, listen to them, offer an apology. And let me say, the apology is not coming from a, a personal place. We're not saying you have to personally take responsibility for what happened. But what we are saying is, hey, it would be nice to say, you know what? We dropped the ball. I am sorry. So offer an apology. Validate what it is that we're feeling. Validate what it is that we're experiencing. The I in, in victim stands for insight. Don't be afraid to provide them with resources and information about the process from beginning to end. One of the things I wish the state of North Carolina did was give me insight. It's a lot of information that I found out eight years later after my rape kit was tested that I wish I knew eight years ago when I was going through this process. And so because I didn't have the insight, 
I didn't know what the process was going to look like. I didn't know um, that after the rate kick comes, then I have to go through the notification process and have to meet with the DA. And I didn't know these things. So provide the insight, give them the resources. And if you don't know, connect them to somebody that does know so that they feel like they can make a very informed decision about what it is that they want, because this is their choice. The C in victim stands for compassion. Again, be a listening ear. They're not asking, they're not trying to beat you up. They're not trying to blame you for what has happened. They just want to be heard. We just want to be heard. And again, I can only share from my experience, I wish that I was heard. I wish that I didn't have to stand in front of, and I'll share, when I encountered law enforcement, the officer literally asked me seven times. Was I sure that he raped me because I knew him? Seven times I counted. That's not being compassionate. If I tell you that it that's what it was, then you compassion is believing me enough to say, okay, this is we'll take the report. We'll do what we have to do to support you. So be compassionate. The T in victim stands for timely. Provide them with timely and up-to-date information regarding their case. I shouldn't have to wait eight years to find out that the DNA test came, like it was a DNA match on my rape kit. That's, that's, to me, that's an injustice. So provide them with timely information. Let them know, hey, this is where we are in the process. This is what needs to happen next. This is the part we need you to play. Again, giving them, taking them on that journey with you, step by step together. It's a partnership. And I know law enforcement a lot of times get a bad rap, but you want to know how we can build that bridge? It's to partner together with the victim, the survivor, or the driver. Because we don't know what's best for us, but the more insight we get, the more we can make an informed decision. The I in, in victim stands for instruction. Again, be willing to guide them through this process. Be willing to hold their hand as they make a decision. And let me tell you, the decision is very hard to make. It is not a, you wake up the next day and boom, I want to go ahead and prosecute. No, it's very hard to make. And so give that space. Be willing to be as patient as they need you to be during this process. Ask them. How can I support you in making this decision? Because again, it is not that, diff that, that easy to make. As someone who just had to make that decision again eight years later for my rape kit, it wasn't easy. I went back and forth with my support system. I went back and forth in my mind. I went prayed about it. I talked to my therapist about it. I did all these things to process just to make the decision. So again, be willing to guide them, be willing to hold their hand, be willing to support them in making that decision. And then the M in victim stands for mindfulness. Always keep in mind that you are encountering somebody's child, somebody's friend, somebody's colleague, somebody's sibling, somebody's parent. So practice mindfulness. Again, we want to work with law enforcement because we don't understand this process. But it's very hard to do when we encounter law enforcement to be cold or don't believe us. I'll tell you, I got raped on a Sunday. I didn't report it till Tuesday. And it's because of my fear that nobody was going to believe me. It was because of my shame of this. I allowed this to happen because I let them in my house. So unless you have experienced it for yourself, you're not going to understand how difficult this really is. And so in closing, I just really want you guys to begin to think of the word victim in a different way. It's no longer the definition that we're used to. It really is pro providing practical steps that you can take when you're encountering any victim of a crime, okay? And again, that is to validate, that is to give insight, that is to be compassionate, that is to provide timely information give instruction, and of course, be mindful. And so again, I thank you guys for allowing me to really be a part of this training. And I hope that you guys take this information with you, hearing it directly from a thriver of sexual assault, that this is what we need in order to work successfully together when dealing with sexual assault cases.
All right. So that wraps up our presentation on Maryland Sexual Assault Kit Initiative. Um, we'll hang out here if anyone has any other questions in the chat or otherwise. I think I tried to um, catch every question that was mentioned during the presentation. Um, but thanks again to Leah for, for sharing your, your story and your experience. Um, we really, one of our goals um, for our project is to really get feedback directly from each survivor. Um, and having Leah as part of our team has been excellent. So any questions you have, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll hang out for a couple minutes.